More games, more gears. It's Game Boy Works Guide in episode 11. Last time on Game Boy Works Gaiden, we looked at Revenge of Drancon, a game that took on Nintendo, Game Boy, and Super Mario Land on its own terms and came out looking pretty good. Now we jump ahead the following week to December 15th, 1990, for a game that sees Sega taking on Epix, Atari, and the Lynx on their own terms. Surprisingly though, I have to give Lynx the win in this contest. G-Lock stands in a head-to-head -head rivalry with Epix's Lynx launch title Blue Lightning, but despite lacking Sega's arcade legacy, Epix's game honestly holds its own versus G-Lock. Blue Lightning was one of many aerial combat games to follow in the slipstream of Sega's arcade hit Afterburner. So for that matter was G-Lock. It's an actual spin-off from Afterburner, focused on somewhat more varied combat scenarios, but generally built around the same intense superscalar aerial maneuvers as that hit. The lineage was pretty clear to see in the arcade release of G-Lock, as an Afterburner, players took control of an F-14 Tomcat, that wildly popular jet fighter that was probably the US Navy's most successful recruitment tool in the late 80s. G-Lock was a little muddled in terms of the specifics though, since most enemies also flew F-14s. Though unlike an Afterburner, G-Lock was less focused on combat above the cloud ceiling and centered more on nap of the earth, air to surface conflicts. Where Afterburner had employed its superscalar tech to create a white knuckle sensation of speed high in the air, dodging and juking while streaking through the clouds, the G-Lock arcade cabinet involved more skimming the hills and flying through narrow canyons to take out enemy vessels in constrictive waterways. The overall effect was that of a hybrid between Afterburner and Thunderblade, faster than the latter, but featuring more environmental hazards than the former. On Game Gear, however, G-Lock turned out to be a much simpler and much less impressive creature. The overall idea comes through in that you control a Tomcat battling enemy fighter craft while taking out their sea forces, but the difference between a Model Y arcade board containing multiple X68000 processors and the humble Z80 powered Game Gear really makes itself felt here. G-Lock on Game Gear basically offers two forms of environmental detail, the surface of the ocean and endless rows of identical hilltops. The canyon walls and jutting rock formations that made G-Lock such a tense experience in its primal arcade form are completely missing, and every single mission here is basically indistinguishable from the next. The closest thing to variety here is that sometimes you fight over the desert rather than over the water. However, literally the only difference between North African sand dunes and Persian Gulf whitecaps is their color palette. You see the same surface graphical assets whether you're flying over water, desert, or grassy plains. Sega did make an effort to shore up G-Lock's deficiencies on Game Gear. There's a level select system that allows you to pick one of eight different missions from a grid before tackling the final battle in the center grid square, kind of like in a Mega Man game. There's also a shop system between levels in which you can exchange the points you've earned in combat for better armor, more fuel, additional weapons, and other upgrades. However, neither of these features make up for the fact that all eight missions are effectively identical outside of their color palette and the ferocity of the enemy forces. The Game Gear version also loses the arcade's variable viewpoint system. You're always seated in the cockpit and can't shift your perspective to behind the plane. You can still do a defensive loop to try to dodge enemy fire, a feature referenced by the title which is short for G-Force Induced Loss of Consciousness, but this is far less convincing here than in the arcade. In terms of aerial combat, G-Lock is fairly standard stuff. You have a Vulcan chin turret as your main weapon, and a limited number of auto-lock missiles for taking down targets quickly. A radar system reveals the relative location of enemies, and your fuel gauge doubles as your armor and your health status. Your goal in each mission is to destroy a set number of specific targets, after which combat ends and the remaining bad guys just kind of let you limp safely on home, I guess. Like Super Monaco GP, G-Lock really lacks the punch of the arcade game it's based on. Unlike Super Monaco GP, which became a proper F1 career simulation on Game Gear, there's not enough added here to make up for the cuts. This really pales in comparison to Blue Lightning on Lynx, which approximated superscalar technology in a fairly impressive way and offered dozens of missions with considerably more variety than the nine monotonous conflicts seen here. Admittedly, Sega of Japan probably didn't even register Lynx as competition since that system was never released in Japan at all, and G-Lock had no equivalent on Game Boy. But even taken on its own merits, it's not really a game that begs to be played. For those who do want to try it regardless, Sega did republish it on 3DS Virtual Console. However, my recommendation would be to skip that port, pay a few bucks extra for M2's excellent conversion of the game for Switch as part of the Sega Ages line. Out the same day in Japan as G-Lock Air Battle is a game far better suited to portable hardware than a super scalar arcade game. Yes, it's another version of Sokoban. And yes, it's exactly what you'd expect. You control a kid in a warehouse, pushing, never pulling, boxes around in an attempt to relocate them all to specific target spaces. 
Puzzles grow in complexity, and your movements are tracked to let you compare your efficiency against that of other players. Sokoban on Game Gear is the same thing as Boxel on Game Boy, although it might be more accurate to say it's the same thing as Boxel and Boxel 2 combined. This version of the game contains a whopping 300 stages of box-pushing puzzle action, which, depending on your enthusiasm for pushing boxes, is either a lot to enjoy or a lot to dread. I will say that Thinking Rabbit and Riverhill Soft did a much more pleasant job of bringing Sokoban to Game Gear than Atelier Double did on Game Boy. While the two systems share identical pixel resolution, Sokoban looks a lot nicer here than it does on Game Boy. More importantly, it moves better too. The action is considerably faster and more responsive than Boxel was, with snappier movement and less of a delay to register your efforts to push the boxes. This alone makes for a greatly improved experience over Boxel and its sequel. The levels and puzzles here appear to be mostly the same as those seen on Game Boy, though they're different from the ones seen in previous Sega adaptations of Sokoban, beginning with the SG-1000 version many years prior. Although the workings and mechanics of this game should have been very familiar to portable gaming fans by the time Sega published it as a Japan-only release, this was definitely the one to get. Okay, now this is more like it. Up until now, Game Gear's launch library has basically been Sega checking off a series of expected boxes. We've had a racer, a shooter, a vintage arcade port, a Tetris-style puzzler, and even a Sokoban game. All titles and genres that you would expect to see at the launch of any Japanese console. Those types of games had also been represented in ample numbers on Atari Lynx and Game Boy by this point. But with Dragon Crystal, Sega delivers something truly unique. While Dragon Crystal arrived the same month as Final Fantasy Legend 2 on Game Boy, meaning it was hardly the world's first portable role-playing game, it is the very first take on a very specific RPG subgenre, the roguelike. In fact, Dragon Crystal was created in parallel to, and released just a few weeks after, the very first console roguelike, so far as I'm aware. Despite sporting different names, you could almost consider Dragon Crystal a simultaneous port of that other game, as they share graphical assets, and aside from a cosmetic element hinted at in the game's title, they play almost exactly the same. Dragon Crystal's companion release, Fatal Labyrinth for Sega Genesis, was created as a sort of clever hack. Sega of Japan had launched a network-based download service for the Japanese version of their 16-bit console, the Mega Drive, which was a pioneering effort in the console space. Players could connect to a server to play games, and part of the appeal of that service, called MegaNet, was that subscribers could download unique titles to play on their console. When MegaNet launched at the beginning of November 1990, mere weeks after Game Gear's debut, one of its initial offerings was Fatal Labyrinth, or rather, Shi no Meku. Given the low bandwidth and download speeds available to subscribers in 1990, MegaNet games necessarily needed to be tiny, compact programs. Amazing as it would have been for Sega to have offered downloadable versions of mainstream console releases like Fantasy Star 2 and 3 to fulfill the expectations of a Japanese audience hungry for role-playing experience, such a feat was simply beyond the means of MegaNet's infrastructure. So to work within MegaNet's limitations, Sega's dev team for Fatal Labyrinth, which included future Sonic team members Hirokazu Yasuhara and Naota Ushima, looked to the world of networked computers for inspiration. Back in the days of dumb terminals and shared computing cycles, a game called Rogue had taken the Vax crowd by storm. Built for systems running strictly on text displays where bandwidth and storage space were severely limited resources to be used as conservatively as possible, Rogue made up for its front-facing technical restrictions by running an extraordinarily complex rule set beneath a stark ASCII interface. Among other things, Rogue randomized its contents for each new player session. The locations and specifics of both monsters and treasures, and even the specific functions of consumable items varied wildly between one game and the next. By using simple text icons as graphics and generating dungeons procedurally, Rogue managed to have minimal impact on shared networks while creating theoretically infinite play. This was the perfect model for Sega to use on its groundbreaking but similarly constrained modem-based network for Mega Drive. And so Fatal Labyrinth was essentially a console interpretation of Rogue. While less complex in terms of its mechanical systems than Rogue, after all it needed to work with a three-button controller interface rather than a full computer keyboard, it incorporated many of the key tenets of the game while giving everything a fairly workmanlike but nevertheless appealing visual overhaul. Game Gear, of course, didn't offer any kind of dial-up service along the lines of MegaNet. The console was functionally more limited than the Genesis, with less ROM space for data storage and lower processing and graphical power. Fatal Labyrinth, designed to run on the minimal specs of a powerful 16-bit console, translated neatly to Game Gear. The Dragon Crystal conversion suffered a bit of graphical degradation, and it lacks the eerie FM synth soundtrack of its big sibling, but the basic gameplay comes through intact. Dragon Crystal obeys many of the key principles of Rogue and the roguelike genre, 
It operates with global, turn-based action. Enemies only act when the player does, with actions doled out on a per-character basis according to their respective speed ratings. Each session, the game generates a different dungeon layout and shovels the location and nature of everything inside. Your character grows in power both by leveling up and by equipping better gear, and enemies become more powerful in nature the further into the labyrinth you travel. A stamina drain system, which is mitigated by consuming food, forces you to hustle along to avoid running out of energy and suffering ill health effects. The game even embraces use ID with the identity of many items you acquire being indeterminate until you either use some sort of item to reveal their nature, or just risk it and use them in battle. Using unknown items is always chancy because there are equal odds you'll experience some sort of beneficial effect or that you'll totally screw yourself over. Although many of the more advanced features of roguelikes are absent in Dragon Crystal, there are enough hazardous factors to worry about, including traps and status effects, that it's always a challenging experience. Your quest is to descend through 30 levels of the dungeon across differently themed regions in order to acquire the mystical fire goblet, the actual prospects of pulling that off are fairly slim. Dragon Crystal makes use of permanent death, and when you die, you return to the beginning of the game and have to start all over from floor 1 and experience level 1. Although, unusually for a roguelike, this isn't a completely hard and fast law. You're allowed to use the gold you've collected to purchase the opportunity to continue, which allows you to carry forward your equipped gear, current floor, and character level. But if you don't or can't continue, a game over amounts to a hard restart. But you do at least have the option. The continue option almost seems like a concession to the game's imperfections. Procedurally generated portable RPG was a pretty bold innovation for 1990, and Sega didn't quite nail it. The game has a tendency to generate levels whose exits are located in spaces you can't physically reach, leaving you trapped with no path forward besides dying. Once you die and continue, the broken level will be regenerated in a new layout, which one hopes will actually contain a valid exit. On the happier side, there's also a fun gimmick to Dragon Crystal, as the title suggests. As you explore, you're accompanied by a large egg that follows around behind you. Eventually, the egg hatches and becomes a dragon, which grows in size as you venture ahead. Weirdly, the dragon doesn't actually help in battle, even though it seems like a big ol' fire lizard would be a pretty handy asset to have in your corner for a difficult game like this. It's not the biggest or most intricate console roguelike ever, but Dragon Crystal does hold a place in history as the first proper take on the genre to appear on a portable console. As with G-Lock, Sega has seen fit to preserve this release, at least for the time being, through the 3DS Virtual Console, where it holds up a fair bit better than G-Lock. Its companion release, Fatal Labyrinth for Genesis, is also readily available through the Sega Genesis Classics Collection compilation for modern consoles and Steam. And who knows, with these collections spin features, you might actually be able to finish the game. And rounding out 1990, we have another game that we've already seen on Game Boy. Well, more or less. Shanghai from Activision was Game Boy's very first third-party release, and it's just about that here on Game Gear as well. This release is called Shanghai 2, but there's not really all that much to distinguish it from the Game Boy release, or the Master System release for that matter. Shanghai 2 does offer a few niceties not seen on Game Boy. For starters, you can challenge six different tile configurations, ranging from the standard setup to more arcane variants that increase your likelihood of losing the game by leaving a few tiles unmatched. Shanghai 2 also includes two additional modes on top of the standard play option, which is called Solitaire here. You can go head-to-head -head against another player with the Game Gear's link cable, and you can play a speed-focused variant with the tournament mode. The brisk pace of tournament actually does a pretty good job of making Shanghai feel a little more like the breakneck tabletop mahjong from which the concept was very loosely derived. Ultimately though, the real selling point of Shanghai 2 on Game Gear is the same as that of Tyson Mahjong Haopai. It's in color. Dealing with ornate mahjong tiles as tiny monochrome Game Boy graphics was never a pleasant prospect and simply adding back the color information helps reduce eye strain and visual ambiguity quite a bit. Interestingly, this is a different Shanghai 2 than the one that would appear on Sega Genesis, though at their most basic level, they all play about the same. This Game Gear cartridge, like about half the others we've seen so far, would go on to be a Japan-exclusive release, the US Game Gear library being a tiny subset of the larger Japanese catalog. And that wraps it up for Game Gear's 1990 library. It's going to be quite a while before we jump into Sega's 1991 lineup, but don't worry, give it time and there'll be plenty of tiny games from Sega to look forward to.